This is Keys to the Shop, episode 92, Orthodoxies and On-Ramps, with Tony Kanicki of Yes, Please. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFerio. I'm your host for the show, and I'm excited to welcome Tony Kanicki of the new company, Yes, Please, a coffee subscription service that is all about um, making on-ramps for consumers into specialty coffee. And I can't wait to share this conversation with you. Uh, Before we get started here, of course, we want to thank our sponsors here, Keys to the Shop. And that starts with Prima Coffee. So Prima Coffee is a specialty coffee equipment supplier based out of Louisville, Kentucky. And from the beginning, their mission has been to provide the best coffee brewing equipment available to the general public and to professionals. Uh, Their focus is on curating the best equipment for every need from uh, grinders, espresso machines, uh, undercounter refrigeration. You just look around your cafe and all the equipment that you have in there. They can get that for you. They pretty much anything you can think of. Um, they put a big emphasis on having the expertise to help their customers get the right gear to fit every situation. I've known them from the beginning and they are fantastic people to work with and just fantastic people. So just go to prima-coffee.com and uh, check out what they have to offer. Reach out to them, email, call, whatever. Uh, let them know that you heard about them on Keys to the Shop. And uh, I know you're going to have a good experience with Prima Coffee. And my thanks to Prima for your support of Keys to the Shop. Also, I want to thank our sponsor, Pacific Foods. Uh, they're the ones behind the Pacific Barista Series line of non-dairy performance beverages, which are designed specifically for professional baristas and the standards for excellence that they demand. So uh, whether it's almond milk, soy, coconut, rice, or uh, oat milk now, uh, its ability to take the heat from steaming, produce an unmatched silky texture, and keep the flavor balance focused on coffee makes it a perfect choice for your cafe's menu. You know, Pacific is a company that has been a huge supporter of specialty coffee uh, for a long time, and they demonstrated this passion for the community by listening to and serving the needs of real specialty coffee professionals. So I would highly encourage you, go to pacificfoods.com, that's pacificfoods.com, and learn more about their barista series line of non-dairy beverages and see how they can elevate the quality of your non-dairy options in your cafe. And my uh, thanks to Pacific for their support of Keys to the Shop. So today we are talking with the legendary Tony Kanicki, better known as Tonks in the industry. And uh, we're talking with him about his new company, Yes Please. Um, He is the co-founder of this company, along with his business partner, Sumi Ali. And they're really hoping to democratize the way that people consume great coffee. Um, Tony has been in the industry ever since the days when he was a barista and then head roaster over at... Seattle's Victrola Coffee. In 2006, he went on to uh, bend the coffee bar genre as a part of Intelligentsia's Los Angeles project. He is one of the early people in the third wave movement. Um, He also is one of the first people to have a coffee blog. And in 2011, uh, frustrated with how the top roasting companies focused on baristas and beverages, more so than giving footholds to connoisseurs, he started the company Tonks Coffee. Uh, which pioneered the direct consumer subscription service model and uh, sourced great coffee from around the world and empowered uh, coffee lovers to brew great coffee at home, uh, just like they would find in a, in a shop. So in 2014, Tonks Coffee was acquired by Blue Bottle Coffee, becoming the Blue Bottle at home service. And uh, Tony's itch for finding new on-ramps for getting people into coffee remained, leading him deeper into a still unfinished book project and the $1 coffee project for local. So with Yes Please, Tony and Sumi are aiming to democratize great coffee and just make it accessible to everybody um, in the at-home, you know, empower the at-home crowd and turn them into connoisseurs, really. Um, They have an accessible price point. Uh, If for their coffee, they are using a blend they call the mix that is going to be a um, no filler, just excellent coffee, uh, intentional blend. And we talk a lot about uh, blending here in this conversation. So stay tuned for that. Um, 
In addition, we talk about Tony's professional history and how that informs the company's ethos. So we get a little bit of that third wave history going on here. And throughout the conversation, we talk about challenging orthodoxy uh, in the industry, intentional blending, pricing for accessibility, um, onboarding customers into specialty, and addressing the industry's echo chamber, kind of a self-congratulatory nature of our industry. And there's much more in this conversation. I think that's going to be really helpful to you. Tony just makes a lot of great points, has a lot to say that I think is going to help shape our approach to customers in the shop. Even though we're talking about a company that's all about kind of bypassing the retail store, I think the philosophy and the lessons that we can learn from this for those of us who work in retail are just invaluable. And uh, yeah, so I really hope that you enjoy this conversation. So let's just get right into it. Here's my conversation with the great Tony Kanicki of Yes, Please. All right, Tony. Hello. Welcome to Keys to the Shop. Thank you. Uh, it is good to be here. Um, <laughs> I haven't done too many of these podcasts, so uh, hopefully I don't sound like a, a total fool or an idiot and your audience gets something out of this. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we will. Um, I want to say right up front, congratulations. You got your uh, Kickstarter funded 100%. Was that today? Last night. Ah. Yeah. Um, so I think that was like day seven or eight. So one week into a four week campaign. We cleared our goal, which feels uh, really good. I mean, even though, you know, you kind of see it coming, it still feels like a, a victory when that number rolls over. So yeah, you're giving updates on Twitter at 97, 98, 99. <laughs> yeah, just a little I, excited. I, I was I was a little more excited than I expected to be yesterday, for sure. So this venture that you've got going on, yes, please. Um, this kind of came up at, uh, this came up about a year or so ago through local. I remember first seeing, uh, your company with the $1 cup of coffee. And there was a lot of conversation around that a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. and it's no different right now. And so you've been kind of stirring the pot with the concept um, and commentary along with it. And I, and I know we're going to get to talk about that in this episode. But you've been in coffee. You're one of the, basically, I could say, founding members of the third wave. You know, you and I have uh, kind of known each other for, you know, since the early 2000s. How have you arrived at this point in your coffee career through all of these years going through, you know, different phases of, of employment and business ownership, et cetera? How have you come to this point? I mean, I, I feel like it, it starts as an accident and, and I don't know how true that is for you, but I feel like for, for people like you and I, our generation of, of coffee people, when you could count, you know, the number of <laughs> known coffee names on like two hands, uh, yeah. I, I think most of us sort of ended up in it without the intention that this was necessarily going to be a career path or that there was uh, e even, I, I mean, I, I had no conception that the coffee universe that we're in now would, would be so big and interesting and um, full of personalities as it is today. Uh, it just seemed like this, you know, mysterious fog that we were all trying to work our way through and that if you found anyone to dialogue with it with about it um from you know consumers or other professionals it was kind of a it was kind of a miracle it was um, yeah i can resonate with that finding each other. um so you know every step since then I've, I've always tried to kind of keep that like beginner's mind um sense of not um, not accepting like the conventional wisdom and the and the group think and the idea that 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 these things are are established because I think coming into it there was there was no orthodoxy there was no real establishment the the sort of um, second wave didn't really have a lot of um, wisdom or traditions to transmit to those of us that were just kind of stumbling into the coffee industry for the first time um, so. You know, we were all sort of figuring it out, and it meant that you know we could color outside of the lines because there weren't that many lines, and um, and so I think you know my my attitude about you know my path um, in and out of the industry over the years has been, you know, what what can we do that's sort of, you know, 
get back to that 40,000 foot perspective and, and rethink some of these assumptions and um, challenge some of these, uh, you know, quickly emerging orthodoxies that, that I think aren't necessarily getting, you know, our, our customers um, where, you know, where we want them to be for understanding our product or, or getting ourselves into a place where we feel like we have a good grasp on what we're doing. Um, I, I think it's, I think it, it has the feeling where there's so many people um, and so many shops and so many people doing kind of amazing vanguard things that, that it's this, uh, that there's a strong establishment or a foundation there. And, and I think that, you know, when you talk one-on-one -on -one with, with coffee professionals that are really wrestling with stuff around service or, um, you know, drink preparation, even um, certainly roasting uh, to a large degree, um, everyone still uh, feels like they're, they're just chipping away at, at some of the hard problems. Right. So it's essentially what you're saying is it's too early to really establish orthodoxy. We should be continually open to reassessing the rules that we laid down in the absence of rules that existed at that time. But are you thinking or do you think that we have basically um, established some rules that we don't like to go beyond that you're trying to go beyond? Um, I, I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. I, I think that for, you know, talking to young people who come into the industry, there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, big names and charismatic voices and thought leaders. And, um, and I think it's kind of easy to get the impression that, you know, that you're coming into this world where, where, you know, the ground rules are there, they're established, you know, you just kind of have to tease them out and, um, and, and build some small piece on top of, you know, stand on the shoulders of those giants. And, and I think that, you know, we should look at our giants as being a little bit smaller um, <laughs> and, you know, find some other shoulders to stand on and, and look at kind of what other, you know, stop, stop sort of regarding coffee as being uh, this, you know, hermetic, cloistered, you know, exceptional thing and look at other parts of the culinary world that um, have found success in different ways and engaged uh, their customers in different ways around um, around the values inside of their product. And so I always look to craft beer as, as the example of something that, that had its rise at the same time as uh, coffee's third wave, but managed to keep more of a, a blue collar feel uh, about it and um, and really I think did a good job of, of having um, no obvious hierarchy between the people who were actually sort of creating the product and, and mastering it and exploring the space and their customers who were you know just enthusiasts or connoisseurs drinking it and um, and it seems like they all speak the same language they're all kind of talking about the same thing and their enthusiasms uh, uh, are are kind of identical and in coffee i feel like you you cross this threshold once you're inside of the industry where the stuff that we do and care about or talk about or our language it becomes very uh, esoteric it's it's like a professional vernacular and um and we can try to teach it to our customers and it gives you know some of our customers that want to go down that rabbit hole a, a sense that they're you know, participating in this in this kind of new and exciting thing, but I, I don't think it really translates to just the the casual person who can certainly you know tell the difference between great coffee, good coffee, and mediocre coffee, um, but isn't necessarily going to come to public cuppings and learn the procedures and um, speak the same language that we do about it. So I, I think there's just kind of a missing piece there on how you onboard people into um, feeling empowered around their own uh, appreciation and connoisseurship of our product. You're talking about onboarding for the consumer, not just, you know, cause we talk about onboarding baristas into the industry, but you're talking about the customer. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I mean, part of why I think with, with Tonks it was, you know, I don't want to do a coffee bar. Um, <laughs> I've, I've participated in coffee bars. I've been a barista. Um, I, I, helped open and uh, do some interesting coffee bar projects. Uh, but I, I felt like, you know, I mean, we, we do have this, I, I can parse this a few different ways um, to, to take it down a few directions, but I think um, 
you know, and, and I'm sure you've talked about this with other guests that, you know, we have this kind of echo chamber phenomenon where there's a lot of communication, very high bandwidth of coffee professionals talking to other coffee professionals. And I mean, it's the, it's the nature of your podcast, right? Um, yeah, there's kind of, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we, we like to dialogue about this stuff, you know, we're, we're our own best audience. Um, but that also creates the situation where, you know, we're, we're, we're the only ones who can validate each other's work at a certain point or validate each other's kind of professional status. And, um, and that we're always kind of struggling with and, and feeling, you know, behind the curve in the culinary world of getting that same kind of validation from, you know, the, from the public. Um, and, you know, we do these barista competitions, we have these big events, latte art throwdowns, all this stuff is very inward facing. It doesn't, it doesn't have an audience uh, with the people that are actually kind of paying the bills and keeping the lights on and buying the drinks. Um, so that's frustrated me. And, and I think, um, you know, to kind of go uh, down, you know, the cliff's notes of my origin story with this stuff, I think when I started with Intelligentsia um, and did their first coffee bar in Los Angeles, um, you know, that was 2006. It was kind of a, Seminal time, I think, for for the third wave of coffee, where um, you know there were there were a handful of kind of really interesting kind of genre bending coffee bars that were opening in that period. Um, Ritual in San Francisco was starting up. Um, Billy Wilson, I think, was was doing the the beginnings of Barista, which I think would be the the first really interesting and, and I think one of the best, you know, multi roaster shops that ever happened. And, right. um, and, and, you know, and, and people in, internally in the industry, you know, we were all kind of excited about this stuff. Like people were really sticking their neck out and trying new things. And I think, you know, Intelligentsia was in this real deep leadership position around, um, around their sourcing program and the quality of what they were bringing in. But, you know, their shops in Chicago were still in this, sort of second wave mold where um, they didn't feel like sort of really high end hospitality environments. Um, you still had like 35 drinks on the menu. The menus look like Excel spreadsheets and <laughs> brochures and signage. And, and you, you just, it, it was, it was very hard to kind of read into the values of the product and, and they were still making lots of different products to fill lots of different segments of customers. And so Coming into Los Angeles, which didn't really have any kind of emergent third wave culture at that point, it was it was a blank slate. And I think, you know, a town where where people are ready to try new things and, and you can, you know, you can do something goofy there and it, it's not going to be seen as uh, immediately pretentious. And I think the way it would have been the Pacific Northwest. Um, so. That was a great opportunity. You know, we got the drink menu down from, you know, 31 flavors to uh, seven items and got rid of sizes, got rid of, you know, dimes, nickels and pennies in the cash drawer and hid the cash drawer, made you uh, interact with the barista. And, you know, part of that was like, let's try to make barista be a, a sustainable, real job that we can afford to pay people real money for. And um, and, and kind of, you know, even though it was a Chicago company operating in the new market, we wanted it to feel like the person that you ordered your drink from is the person who kind of owns the place, you know, should, should feel the sense of ownership and, right. and really owns your experience. And, and, um, you know, and if, if there's a problem, you know, you, you don't need to like complain to the manager, <laughs> you know, you're talking to the person who can, who can fix that or who's, who's responsible for that. So. You know, I think that was like uh, the beginning of or part of um, a trend in kind of changing the, the hospitality environment. And I think that invited customers in to say, OK, there's something more going on. There's something new going on in this coffee world and, and we can explore that. When I left Intelligentsia, the, the frustration that I had was, you know, that the business at that time, it, it was growing fast and, you know, it kind of had its, its management struggles and things that, you know, any business getting to that scale does. Um, but on the bottom line, we were probably 75% revenue wholesale, 25% retail, which meant that if you think about the volume of beans going through the roasting environment, we're, you know, in the neighborhood of like 85%, 90% of the bean volume is going out to wholesale customers. Um, so it's, 
discounted. It's being passed off. There's other companies and other segments in the market that are controlling that end user experience and those customers. And then of that, you know, 10, 15 percent of your volume that's going into the retail environment, most of that's going to make beverages. So it's servicing baristas. It's, you know, it's part of this, um, you know, assembly line kind of, you know, what's really under the hood, a, a fast food business, um, you know, serving people drinks and, and trying to do enough volume and speed to, to keep the lights on, um, which is challenging. Um, so of that, like, small segment of people who were who were selling our coffee beans directly to, who are making it home, who will buy a bag and, you know, spend, you know, upwards of 20 bucks to take a bag home and live with that coffee and understand it and, and experience it and, and, and actually have the, I think the chance, you know, not just kind of one experience in the coffee shop, but to like really see like, okay, what, you know, what can we do with this coffee? What flavors are there? How does it change over time? You know, can I, can I start to detect these flavors that are, are being written about in the bag? Um, those are the people that I think are the most interesting customer, the ones who have the potential to kind of um, carry the industry into a, a connoisseurship that can exist outside of just coffee professionals, which is, I think, a necessary prerequisite to achieving any of these sort of third wave ideals around sourcing and, and farmer and, and changing people's price perception. All that stuff isn't going to happen if we don't get some sort of, you know, uh, connoisseur trajectory consumers uh, out there and empowered. And, and um, so so that that part of the business seemed interesting to me. But, you know, it's like an inverted pyramid and they're they're the smallest part and the least optimized for. So I think when I left Intelligentsia, it had nine full time salespeople working different regions, working wholesale accounts, service department, tech department. Um, but you know, almost no one other than individual baristas who maybe had a passion for, for that part of the product line um, who were really handling the communication with those customers. So I thought, okay, I want to, I want to do a business that's focused on, on just direct to consumer and get rid of all the other segments, get rid of all the other moving parts and just say, what if we built a company from the ground up that was just focused on always trying to deliver the best experience to what I think is the most neglected and most important segment of customers, which is that sort of connoisseur potential like home coffee lover. Um, and so that's been kind of the, the guiding like itch for me to scratch and, and all the projects that I've chosen after that. Um, I think the first thing I did after Intelligentsia was this Slow Food Nation event in San Francisco where uh, in three days, we were able to serve 10,000 people what I felt was kind of a slow food coffee experience um, mm -hmm. in a pretty high volume um, uh, environment. And and that was, uh, you know, without going into too much there, um, I think hopefully there's a few listeners here that, uh, that got to experience that or um, got to participate in it from a volunteer side. But, um, you know, we, we brought together a lot of really great uh, coffee professionals and a few coffee producers and, um, you know, uh, Eileen Hasse from Ritual, Andrew Barnett from uh, Linea um, uh, Echo Cafe at the time, um, and Brent Fortune, um, a, a bunch of people. Uh, Peter Giuliano was, was really helpful. Um, we just got this sort of... Uh, <laughs> you know, pre um, coffee common or, or symposium or, or any of the things that have come after this is like this sort of first, you know, mini convivium of, um, of coffee professionals thinking, you know, how can we create an experience that's, that's consumer facing. Um, and we managed to get, you know, Marzocco donated a bunch of machines. We got ceramics. Um, we had a, a bank of clover brewers behind a curtain um, doing brewed coffee and, and we'd, bring people into our booth and walk them through a tasting experience. And, um, and this is kind of before I think single origin espresso was really a common thing. And we were serving exclusively single origin espressos and, and some, you know, some oddball ones, you know, some Kenyas, some really bright Colombias. And you had, you know, little old ladies who'd never had a shot of espresso in their life drinking a straight shot of, 
of Kenya, you know, four days off the roast, um, ah. pulled by, a, you know, former barista champion or something. And, <laughs> um, and it was, you know, we tried to do the live aid thing of, you know, check your egos at the door. So we didn't talk about brands. We didn't talk about what companies any of these professionals work for. Um, we only talked about the farms and the producers and the varietals and, um, and we tried to have one bullet point for each coffee that was part of the experience that was about something that the producer or the farmer did that affects the way the, the thing you're experiencing in the cup, the, some, some flavor, some taste or some quality of that, that right. the tactile that you could actually experience and trace back to the farm level. Um, and so that was kind of a, an eye opening experience for me that like, okay, there is a way to sort of cut through you know, all the sort of the brand positioning and the second order signifiers and all of these things that, that sort of make people have affinity for, for one coffee company or one coffee experience or one service model over another and just get into, you know, just really the flavor and what's in the cup and why that matters. Um, and so, you know, Tonks Coffee was kind of a, um, an experiment in like, well, what, you know, what happens if we just kind of build a, a business from the ground up that's only focused on giving that experience um, and, and kind of, you know, having building that trust relationship where we're sending somebody a new coffee every two weeks and they don't really get to choose what it is. Um, and, you know, I, I think one of the unspoken conceits of it for us was is that you know, if, if you're someone who loves coffee, if you, if you like good coffee, if you love coffee, we think, you know, nine times out of 10, we can pick something that, that you're going to dig. And that, that one time out of 10 that we throw you a curveball that we're like, okay, this is a crazy, you know, Pacamara. This is, um, you know, this is a coffee from Sumatra that's got some flavors that are not going to be everybody's bag that, you know, that, that we build up enough trust that when we do, push out something that we know is going to be a little divisive. We can kind of set you up. Like, even if this isn't your favorite coffee, you're still going to appreciate having had the experience of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of that, um, you know, what, what I guess in like user experience, you'd call like progressive disclosure. We don't give you the whole manifesto right away. We're not asking you to buy into all of the conceits around how we approach coffee. We're just like, we're going to make this easy try this. We're going to empower you to have good results. We'll help you with your brewing. Um, and, you know, if you want to become a connoisseur, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, we're there for you. But we're not asking you to, like, declare yourself uh, a wannabe coffee snob from day one um, to kind of embrace what we're about. Yeah, it, it really does seem like making things easy for people allows them to more comfortably integrate something new into their rituals. I mean, even if their ritual is going to the shop, it's you still have to like drive and park and go to the shop. And if it's in their kitchen and it's repeatedly in their kitchen on their counter, it's already a part of the, you know, it's a part of the family. Um, yeah. And it becomes a part of their psyche. And uh, it seems like there's just a, a, a more integrated buy-in experience that happens with somebody who takes a bag home. And, you know, obviously we, in retail, so many people, you know, way more than when, um, you know, you and I were first starting, not everybody roasted their own coffee, but it's almost as if everyone does now. Um, yeah. There's so many people roasting coffee because they recognize, I think, whether consciously or unconsciously, that value. Um, so, in, in, so it makes me think, like, this is the question that you're wanting to answer with, with Yes, Please, is how do we take it a step further to sort of uh, disrupt the machinery of retail and making things inaccessible and make it accessible. Is that a, is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Like I, I I'm kind of getting pegged with that disruptive thing, for, <laughs> you know, obvious reasons, but um, you know, and I, and I mean, if that's, you know, if that's, if, if that's what gets us noticed and gets us attention, you know, I'll, I'll take it. Um, but I think it's really more like from a culinary perspective, I feel like it's a continuation of the itches we started to scratch with Tonks coffee, but saying like, let's, let's take that same strategy of, of kind of approachability and, and 
you know, pushing the boundaries of, of exploring what coffees we can bring in and apply that to blending. Um, and I think where it starts to look disruptive maybe is around um, us trying to push the price down. Yes. Um, and certainly that's that's part of it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm less inclined to try to like, you know, deal with the attack surface of that and kind of be defensive and justified and just, I, I'm fascinated that, um, you know, we, we've, we've all believed and, and I still believe that, you know, people should be paying more for coffee, um, for, for reasons that I, I'm guessing most of the people listening to this have, have well absorbed, um, over their time, you know, uh, poking around in the coffee industry. Um, but I think from a, you know, from like the business and economics perspective of it, it's, it's really all relative. Um, we're, you know, you can sell a cappuccino for four or five dollars. The cost of goods on that is, is pretty high, you know, from the paper cup to the milk to, you know, to the waste and more than anything for, you know, the labor and keeping the lights on and, you know, contingent on what kind of volume you can do in your shop. And it's, you know, it's a challenging business. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still like whether that $5 is, you know, 90% margins or 40% margins. Um, it's, you're only putting a few bucks in the cash register every time. It's, it's not super lucrative. And, you know, again, like looking at craft beer, the, the cost on a pint of beer is, you know, of a, of a good micro brews, maybe, you know, 30 cents. Um, the skilled labor that it takes to pull that tap is, you know, about four minutes of training somebody how to, you know, how to, how to tap correctly. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and there's plenty of people that have the skill of, of knowing how to uh, tap a keg already. So it's, you know, and, and they're easily able to charge, you know, four five, six bucks for a pint of beer, or also fill a pitcher and, you know, basically give it to you for, for next to nothing. Um, and, and no one kind of gets hung up on it, that it's eroding any value perception when there's mm-hmm. this much price disparity around one product in one category. But I think in coffee, everyone's really sensitive to, you know, what their neighbor's charging. I, I think in, in our day, um, you know, when we were starting out, it was, you know, how do the prices at our little struggling independent shops compare to Starbucks? Um, and, you know, uh, those of us that were in shops that were trying to go a little beyond what Starbucks was charging, it was, you know, we were self-conscious about it. Um, I think when I started in coffee, the idea that anyone would pay $3 for, you know, for a, a 12 ounce brewed coffee was, oof, that's, that's a tough, that was a tough sell. Oh yeah. You train um, people in, you know, when you bring out a barista, here are the frequently asked questions and here are the things that you're going to have to say. And, and it's, and it's a lot of playing defense, um, you know, and so you're playing defense, but you're also kind of having to talk up like why people should pay this and what the experience is. And, um, you know, and at least until, um, you know, some writers like, you know, Peter Meehan, Oliver Strand and, and people came along, um, to sort of, you know, champion this movement in coffee. It was really like, just felt like, man, you're pushing a boulder uphill, at least in Seattle, it felt that way that, um, you know, with, with Starbucks and everything that had come before the third wave, um, you know, the press in Seattle, the food press, or, you know, the, the people that were talking about this stuff just really had no interest. They didn't see that there was a story in coffee, and, you know, and so we were always kind of, and I think still, the, still kind of chasing this validation from, you know, from the, the chef community and the restaurant community and food writers. And, um, and it's right. always been, like, you know, coffee is the stepchild and we're, man, we're trying to make this movement, but, you know, but we, you know, you, you up the price 20 cents on an Americano and it's, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like the cat died or something. It's, yeah. it's everybody's really struggling in the shop for a week or two. Um, it's always going to be a conversation piece though, the price, cause it's a daily habit, you know, um, you know, you might not drink a beer every single day. And so if you want to drink that Americano every day, you can be so price sensitive. And then we play that catch up game where we have to value this coffee in different ways and show, uh, you know, talk about it in a way that makes people feel comfortable with that price. Cause we do have to increase drink prices on a regular basis. 
Um, so, I mean, how do you go about answering that question of will this, in, in the mind of somebody listening to this, I can hear it like, will this price, like the low price of, of coffee that you're pushing for devalue specialty in the mind of a consumer? Because it seems like, shouldn't we be making a big deal out of specialty and not really apologizing for the price of the coffee? I mean, I think we should not be apologizing for the price of coffee. I, I would agree with that. Um, I think, you know, I mean, there's a lot of hype in coffee. I have obviously benefited from that. I mean, Tonks was, you know, the leader in this sort of emerging subscription coffee category, whatever. But from a real coffee industry perspective, we were a very, very small business um, that had uh, an outsized amount of attention and maybe impact. Um, I think, you know, my hopes for this business are if I'm a fraction of the success of what I had with Tonks Coffee, I'll be very happy um, running this little project. I don't think that our, our price or our value proposition is really going to change. Um, you know, we're not going to tip over anybody else's Apple cart. Um, and essentially, even if we're able to drop the price down lower than what our current target is, which I would like to, but, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of math to do <laughs> around that. Um, and, you know, we may end up pricing so low that we have to change our price, uh, not too far down the road and, and bring it back up. Or that's, um, I, I think it's, it's more that we're not building a business that's predicated on, um, maintaining a retail margin for our wholesale customers. So if we were selling to a coffee shop and still they needed to have a margin to then put this bag on their shelf and still make money, then, then yeah, I think we're undermining, you know, the traditional kind of wholesale distribution model. Um, if we're buying these high caliber coffees and selling them directly to the public at essentially wholesale prices. But I don't think that the scale of our business or what we're doing is, is, you know, going to be that much of a game changer. Um, and I, and I don't know that, you know, I mean, who knows? I mean, other companies may sort of chase us in that space and, and try to compete on price, but I, I don't think that our low price, um, our, I, I should say our lower price is, is going to, um, be the reason that people choose to buy coffee from us versus, you know, um, an intelligentsia or a blue bottle or, um, you know, their local third wave roaster or something. And, and I'm not super interested in trying to capture, you know, a hundred percent of everybody's coffee spend. <laughs> I like to have customers that are encouraged to, to be trying new things and, and sort of building their own palette and finding what they like. And, and, you know, and hopefully, you know, we can compete on a, you know, apples to apples basis, but you know, the other stuff that they bring into their kitchen. Um, yeah. But do it in a way that's like, I think, you know, a, a fair, you know, that, that we're, we're keeping our margins smaller, but we're going to spend less money on marketing. We're, you know, we're not going to sponsor barista competitions. We're not going to be sponsoring every podcast on the planet. You know, there's, you know, we're, we're just kind of, we're not going to have a full-time salesperson. We're really going to run this as, you know, kind of a lean operation that's, that's focused on what we do in front of the roaster and what we do on the cupping table and what we do in blending and, what we do for customer service, which, you know, just feels to me like the next kind of refinement or sharpening of, of what I was trying to do with Tonks. So your goal is to really get people in the door, specialty coffee, and make it accessible. The price is just one of the things that you think might help them make the decision to drink specialty coffee. And then there's the blend. Um, so... Talk to us a little bit about this blending because in the copy you're putting out for your uh, Kickstarter, um, you, there's an assertion about blending that it's dumbed down and it's sort of the uh, dumping grounds for mediocre coffee for consistency's sake. Uh, not that consistency is wrong necessarily. Um, right. I'm sure there's exceptions. There's, Of course, people make great blends out there, but do you really think that blending is so dumbed down by such a wide uh, swath of roasters out there for it to be truly be the majority of, of uh, blends and, and how do you intend to really um, answer that with your product? Well, I mean, I think 
you know, it's, it's fiery rhetoric, uh, for sure. Um, but, but I, but I think I'll stand by most of it. Um, I, it feels like the, there, there's an underlying assumption that, that, you know, there's certain types of customers and, and that, you know, some people want consistency and, 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 and I'm not saying that this is false. I think it's, it's genuinely true. And I think there's reasons that people want consistency, which have a lot to do with, with the kind of crappy batting averages or weird curveballs that, that you're going to find if you just start dancing around most, um, big coffee companies offering lists. But, um, so I would definitely, you know, as a, as a novice consumer, uh, feel much more comfortable retreating to a blend that's going to be, um, maybe a little dumbed down and a little reliable and, and more consistent. Um, that's, that's not unappealing. <laughs> um, but I think that the, the sort of mentality around, you know, when you're a business, um, of the scale of, you know, one of these medium or large size, uh, third wave roasters that has a lot of different types of customers and a lot of different people that you're servicing in different kinds of markets that you do tend to think that the blend is what you steer certain categories of customers to or certain price sensitivity to um and you know is there a culinary element to it are the roasters like really getting in there and inventing things yes absolutely how much of their day-to-day focus is involved in that what does the quality control process look like around that um you know i think there are people doing interesting things in the in the space i don't want to like you know, I, hashtag not all blends, but, um, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, the, the, the general reflexive way to regard them is that, you know, that they're strictly a, a pragmatic, um, way to sort of, you know, maybe your relationship with, with a, a farm, there's, you know, there's kind of the, the A grade, you know, micro lot coffees, but you're also, you know, filling the container with some stuff that, you know, is, you know, maybe not a stunner and, you know, a little less interesting, but, you know, we'll work in this other category or we'll work in this blend or we'll work for this tier of customer. And, you know, and then of course, espresso uh, blending, there's a, a lot of uh, philosophies out there around that. And, you know, as someone who kind of cut my teeth uh, roasting, um, you know, a seven or eight bean espresso blend, I'd, I'd like to sort of poke at some of those orthodoxies a little bit too, because I, I think that espresso blending is another kind of underexplored frontier. And, um, and I'd like for the mix to work well as espresso. I, I suspect that it will um, just kind of based on Sumi and I having uh, very similar philosophies around, around the way we like to balance things in a blend. Um, well, what is that philosophy there? I mean, I don't want to go too deep on this uh, prematurely before we really have a product to put in front of people and, and kind of talk about what we're doing on a, on an individual iteration to iteration basis that I think, you know, we hope that people can taste, but, you know, some of the ideas that, that we've been exploring kind of in cupping are um, certain flavors from certain coffees have thresholds where in a blend um they they show up and kind of max out that that you can take a, a coffee from East Africa that has um, a particular like jammy fruit characteristic, knock it down to 20, 25 percent in the blend. And a lot of those flavor notes are still they're They're, they're above the threshold. They're going to come through just as strong as if you had 50 percent of the blend. Um and so then it's a question of, you know, what do you balance that out with? You know, what's the kind of, what's the harmony? How many components can you put together before they all start to, you know, merge into this undifferentiated wall of sound? And how can you sort of tease them apart and get that dynamic range back in there? What kind of coffees will, will add to the dynamic range or what ones will uh, detract from it? And, um, and, you know, and I hesitate to talk about this stuff because it, it, it all sounds and feels a little pretentious to me. And, um, you know, I think there's an audience for talking about that stuff or debating that stuff. And, um, but I, I don't want that to feel like something that, that people have to buy into to, to have the experience of what we're doing. So, 
Um, but I think that, you know, from an espresso perspective, it's I, I look at what's the degree of difficulty to get an espresso extraction out of this coffee or this blend of coffees. Um, and I think there's some coffees that, that are high wire act where you really have to like get, get the dial in exactly right to hit the target and anything off of that high wire line and you're, you're in a bad place. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of coffees like that being sold as espresso now that, um, because of the advances in machine technology and barista craft, you know, we've been able to like walk a narrower path to kind of deliver a specific experience. And, um, and I don't always enjoy those espressos personally. I think I'm a little more old school, um, in the sort of extraction ratios I like and the, the balance and flavor profile I like. And some of those things seem a little, you know, one dimensional kind of, yes, you can taste that flavor. You can, see what the farmer did you can taste that varietal but is that you know is i'd rather taste that on a cupping table than than in a in a kind of one-dimensional shot of espresso um so so there's sort of you know we we, we want to have more um you know more breadth uh, of flavor there um i feel like i'm kind of rambling like we could well you know we what i'm, I'm really through. picking up from this is is something that it's it's uh what blends are almost created to do is be a answer to a lot of questions um there's a flexibility that doesn't necessarily have to be the antithesis of intentional quality for the components that go into it and it sounds like you just want complexity and intention and care for each component and sure i think all of us will sort of um, admit that there's the blender coffees that we just don't have any room. We don't, ha we can, we're not selling them on the shelves anymore. Can we put it in the espresso blend? Can we put it in that heritage blend that's been around for a while that customers love, but we hate? Um, right. <laughs> we, we all, I think, do it. And so it's, it's kind of cool that, you know, this is one of the things that you're pursuing and um, is, is becoming even, something you see barista champions do like Cole McBride had a great blend he used for his milk course. Um, yeah. and he had, his main thing was creating drinks and, uh, his craft having intention as the main focus. So I feel like this is sort of the very of the moment. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I hope so. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't want to say that like, that we're trying to prescribe this is how blend should be approached or, or to sort of damn, you know, the, the, or, or, you know, expose the way that the sausage gets made at, at other roasters, because I, I think that, you know, all of this is totally understandable and it's part of our craft and, you know, and we should embrace it and, you know, learn how to talk about it and kind of bring consumers along for the ride and, you know, stop sort of getting too romantic about the language we use to talk about some of the things that are in our product line. I think for us being kind of, focused on just a single type of customer, um, a single sales channel and creating a singular product. It's sort of saying, well, you know, what, what can we do if we just remove all the other constraints and kind of do, I think the, the same sort of, you know, serialized just in time driven by, um, you know, our, our culinary whims sourcing that we were able to do with, with Tonks, um, where, you know, we're not trying to always fill out a product line. We're not trying to service these sort of customers where we don't care about delivering consistency. We're just like, what's the best thing that we can do right now with, with what's, you know, with what's ready to start coming off the boats. Um, and so that's kind of, I think the, the, the core of the thesis for it, um, not so much a prescription for how we think, you know, other people should approach this stuff. But I think that as a culinary professional in coffee, you know, from a roaster perspective, from a barista perspective, from a green sourcing perspective, it feels like this is the sort of playground that, that everybody who, who does want to kind of push things, who does care about that final experience in the cup over everything else would want to like get their hands dirty with, um, and so I, I'd hope to see more people doing that. It's always kind of surprised me, um, 
you know, I, I helped open a coffee bar a few years back and, you know, it's one of those things where opening day gets pushed back. You're sitting on coffee that, you know, that you ordered expecting, you know, that this would be, you know, day seven, you'd be serving it. And now it's, you know, day 12 and it's starting to go flat and, you know, what do you do? And, um, and so just, you know, on the fly, we started reblending the espresso for the first few days that the shop was open. And sort of once you kind of break that taboo and, and start to really play with the coffee, there's so much that, that you as a barista have the power to do to shape what that final experience you're serving to the customer is. And it's always sort of stunned me that, especially in these multi-roaster shops, that you'll have a barista that will serve you a coffee that, you know, that they'll tell you, ah, I'm not really feeling this. It's not that good. I don't know about the dial in. And, you know, and there's six or seven different coffees on their offering list just sitting there available to them. It's like, man, you're, you know, you're a capital B professional barista. You're going to competitions. You're like, this is who you are. This is your life. And if you're not feeling the stuff that you put out, it, it's, it's right there. You can fix this. You have a palate, you have the power, you know how to dial in coffees, like, like, go for it, like, take a stab at this. What happens if you, you know, throw a little bit of that guad in the hopper and shake it up and, you know, maybe you can fix the thing that you don't like about this shot. And, you know, what happens if you mix two or three different breath states and the same blend together? It's, um, mm -hmm. it's surprising, you know, how far you can get with that. So if, if there's a philosophy there, it's just sort of like, all right, throw out the rule book a little bit, explore this stuff and, and be willing to like, you know, be willing to screw it up. You know, I mean, maybe you mix some things together and it, and it becomes, you know, the kind of uh, brown finger paint phenomenon and it's just not working. Um, but, yeah, you know, barista I think... take home coffee. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. The, the stuff that the stuff that didn't quite make it into the cold brew. <laughs> Um, those of us who are in retail, in stores that, you know, see customers every day, we, you know, we see that retail is really, um, observing the consumer, uh, well, consumer revolution, really. We had, uh, an episode about that earlier in the, the season of, uh, keys to the shop, um, uh, with Kevin Sinnott of coffee con, um, it, and it really seems to me that there's a ton of, um, people taking notice with more coffee classes in stores, um, more of a focus on hospitality to make people feel comfortable. Um, from your perspective, trying to come at this directly from the roaster to people's kitchens, what can we do in the store to really help people uh, onboard into specialty coffee without just overwhelming them and alienating them? Yeah, well, I think it's gotten a lot better. I think that the newer generation of coffee professionals kind of went through their own experience of coming into an industry and seeing that they're, we did and, and still do, I think, make things seem harder than they need to be. Um, and, and that sort of, um, you know, there, there's, there's like two things that, that, that I, that I think you're common to see uh, among coffee professionals in a retail environment. You see the people who are sort of the classic, like, you know, they have all the answers, you know, they're, they're afraid to say, I don't know. They're going to like, you know, try to give you an explanation for, for any, you know, any question that the customer asks um, and, and pepper in as many sort of $5 words as they can. Um, <laughs> and then there's, the opposite, which I see a lot of lately, which I find equally frustrating, where you have someone who's like, oh, you know, I've only been working as a barista for two years. There's so much I don't know. And, you know, that this sort of weird false humility yes. of, of just like, man, you know, like you're like, oh, man, you know, I, I've only been trained by like five different barista champions. I, I hardly <laughs> I don't even I'm afraid to even tell you what this coffee tastes like. Like, <laughs> oh, man, like you're really like putting out this message to this person that, you know, that there's just no hope for them. Like, you know, and, and then, you know, you serve them a drink that maybe is, you know, it's a C plus, but you've delivered it in this sort of a plus kind of environment and, and experience. And, you know, I think that they walk away feeling like, well, 
gosh, these people really love coffee, but I'm just, I guess I'm just not into it because I don't taste what they're telling me I should taste. And, right. um, and so it kind of all gets around to this, like, are you, are you empowering people to kind of feel like they, they can start to grasp this themselves or are you giving them messages that, you know, that are sort of glorifying this hobby that you're immersed in um, that are maybe not really giving them the toeholds to find their own way into it unless they follow directly in your own weird professional footsteps. Um, and so I think everyone's gotten better about that, but the trend is definitely towards, you know, let's not tell people that they need to buy a $700 burr grinder um, you know, the first day that they walk up to the register with a, with a bag of beans. Um, but it's still kind of, I think for, for home consumers, um, there isn't, you know, and, and this is something that I felt like in the first few months of Tonks, just from the email conversations we were having with people that, that we had with just a few hundred customers, more institutional knowledge about what people were doing at home with the coffee in their kitchens then I think, you know, a company like Intelligentsia had as like institutional knowledge for for years of operating in a, in a retail environment selling beans. Um, um, that, that it's just a different way to kind of listen to your customers. And, um, and also it's, you know, it's intimidating to talk to a barista, um, especially in a fancy shop about what you're doing or ask questions like people, you know, people feel kind of reserved and it's also you're under the gun and you don't have a lot of time and you just kind of want to absorb the information you can from your barista and, um, you know, kind of take the mental notes and, um, fix the problem. Whereas, you know, in an email conversation, I found you could really get people to kind of tell you a story and, and, you know, confess their, their theoretical coffee sins and, um, you know, cop to things that they might not be willing to cop to if they were standing face to face with you at a coffee bar and, you know, you're wearing a, a vest and a tie and, um, under the lights. So, uh, so that, that I think was, you know, was, was part of a revelation for us around this idea of, um, you know, just how, you can empower people without dumbing stuff down. You can, you can simplify things without, without compromising like the, the, the aesthetic or culinary in, intention of them. Um, and it's a lot of it is just, you know, that, that you got to treat your customers that, that they're not an audience. They're not there to validate, you know, what makes you special versus the coffee shop down the street. Um, I mean, those things are important, um, but that can't be, you know, that can't be your starting place for, for onboarding a new customer into this world. And, and I think that, you know, enthusiasm is contagious and it's good to express your enthusiasm. So you just have to be careful not to you know, not to sort of nail the, the manifesto to their face um, when, when you get the chance to bend their ear. So as you go about um, your mission with Yes, Please and uh, hoping to just get pe- more people in the door of specialty coffee and onboard them into specialty coffee, um, how can we stay in touch with what you're doing, uh, where, you know, the socials, your, your website, and uh, what can we expect to see from Yes, Please in the coming year? Well, so I think, you know, one of the things we, we talk a little bit about um, in the Kickstarter, and we're not saying too much yet because we don't want to overpromise, but, you know, we're going to do a newsletter in every release. And I think that's going to be a way to kind of uh, connect with our customers a little deeper and kind of let our customers sort of see a little more of what's going on in, in each other's worlds and, and approaches to stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll, I think, be looking to like, Instagram a lot and, and Twitter to a degree to kind of tease out um, some of those uh, some of those pieces as we're putting them together. Um, but I think, you know, and, and I'd like to do more video stuff. We, we played around a lot with um, kind of brew guide videos at, at Tonks and um, we, we did a series called Just Add Water, which, you know, was was all about kind of taking these different brewing methods and, and making them seem simple enough that you could, that you could approach them um, without having to go through like 15 steps. Um, so 
I'd, I'd like to explore doing more stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I mean, I would, you know, to put on my sales pitch hat for a minute, um, you know, I, I'd encourage people. It's, it's, I'm not so much in the business of, of caring about whether someone is a subscriber. I, I understand why everyone jumped on the subscription bandwagon that recurring revenue businesses are great. They're easy to fund. It, it you know, it makes sense. Um, I'm more interested in, you know, creating experiences for people. I think if you want to come and, you know, buy a bag from us one time and never see us again, if you want to, you know, just bag periodically whenever you, you know, have the urge to try something new, like that's, we're, we're cool with that. Um, we're not really selling subscriptions, um, in, in the, in the sort of normal sense. Um, so I think if people are curious about what we're doing, I'd, I'd encourage them to at least jump on the Kickstarter now and, and, um, secure themselves a slot for for our uh, debut release because I think we're going to try to make it really special. And so, so yeah, I, I'd encourage people to catch that debut release, um, you know, throw a little money at the Kickstarter and, uh, and, and just kind of see if this is, you know, um, I, I hope we're not all talk. I hope that, um, you know, what we're, the efforts that we're putting into the cup, I, I think they're, they're sincere, they're legitimate. You know, I, I believe that there's a friends here out there to explore that we're, we're still just scratching the surface of that, um, that the potential of, of coffee to surprise and delight and impress is vast. And, um, I hope we can tap into some of that. And I hope that, um, I hope that people will dig it. Um, and, you know, we want to be supportive of other people in the industry that we think are, you know, that are kind of operating on the same wavelength and exploring the same space that, um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not a competition for us. Um, you know, we think that, um, there is still new frontiers and that people should be exploring them and figuring out new ways to talk about them and new ways to engage customers with them. I think that, uh, you know, that the, the playbook for third wave shops as it exists now is um is pretty well established and you know we know what impact that's had on consumers and and you know it's a growing category but i i think that there's still you know other angles other avenues to engage people that um that we haven't explored deeply enough so hopefully you know yes please plays uh some small part in sussing some of those avenues out Excellent. Well, uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate what you're doing in your work. Um, and I just uh, congrats again on the, the funding of the project and, uh, we'll link to your, uh, website and your Kickstarter in the show notes, uh, of course. So thank you also just for joining us on the show today and just talking about coffee and your philosophy. I'm really into it. And, um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, let's do a follow-up somewhere down the road. So we have opportunities every day to create on-ramps to specialty coffee for consumers, just like Tony is trying to do with Yes, Please. And what I'm left challenged by in this conversation is how much of my time is spent creating those on-ramps in the shop and how much of my time is spent reinforcing the guardrails, <laughs> you know, uh, the guardrails of insider culture and they, they unintentionally and maybe sometimes intentionally alienate people and, and make the road to connoisseurship of coffee more difficult than it has to be. And if we really want to have these um, complete buy-in, like raving fans of specialty coffee who are buying bags of coffee and brewing it at home and really into it, you know, then we're going to take some lessons from this conversation and, and apply them to our bars into our careers is we face the customer every day and have these opportunities. Um, I, I hope that we can more frequently make good coffee easier for people. So I'm just really thankful for uh, Tony challenging us with these things with a yes, please. And coming on the show to discuss so many things I believe will help us make a big impact on uh, customer engagement and retention long term. So thank you, Tony, for coming on. And be sure to check out their Kickstarter website and uh, subscribe to their social media. 
Uh, stay tuned for what is coming through Yes, Please. So if you want the show notes for this episode, just go to keystothoshop.com and on the sidebar, you're going to see a place to put your email and that'll sign you up to receive a weekly newsletter that has just, well, you guessed it, some news and updates about things that are going on at Keys to the Shop, um, as well as the show notes, uh, which are the key takeaways for every episode that we do, which are really valuable in kind of reminding you of those really great points that you you thought about during the interview, but maybe forgot about when you had to get out of your car or you know wherever you happen to be listening, it's not convenient to take notes. It's great because it's delivered right to your inbox, along with the links to the um, articles and episodes or videos or resources that are mentioned during those interviews. So go to keystotheshop.com and sign up for that weekly newsletter. And speaking of news, Coffee Fest Denver is coming up soon. It's actually next week. And so I want to encourage you, if you're in the Denver area, uh, go to coffeefest.com and check out what is available at the Denver show. This is coming up June 8th through the 10th. I'll be there as a latte art judge, as well as a speaker and a few uh, lectures that I would hope to, to see you at. If you're going to go to Coffee Fest Denver, uh, definitely look for me and come say hi. And I would love to meet you and uh, hear a little bit about what you do in coffee and just be really fantastic. I got to meet some of you in Baltimore, and that was an absolute pleasure. And I hope to get the same honor in Denver as well. So go to coffeefest.com again, click on the uh, Denver, it's on the left side, the Denver show, and look at all of the resources and uh, lectures, the free trainings and the accessibly priced trainings as well. There's a lot to offer at Coffee Fest. They've been going for over 20 years and they are the industry's best trade show for retailers. And so uh, coffeefest.com and I hope to see you there. So I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Tony today. It was really great for, for me to just be inspired by his philosophy, just having such a great perspective of so many years in specialty coffee, um, his ideas of onboarding and creating on-ramps for customers is really something that we can lay a hold of and put into practice in our everyday work at the coffee bar. And I know that I will be, I'm challenging myself to do that more. And I hope that you walk away challenged as well. Um, thank you for joining me. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.